July 1962. These troops, forming a special task force, were the first in our Army's history to engage in a tactical exercise supported by live nuclear firepower. Every man was required to wear a security badge and a radiological dosimeter. Early in July, the task force arrived at Nellis Air Force Base, the railhead nearest to the Atomic Energy Commission's Nevada test site, where the exercise would be carried out. The mission had been given a high priority and a short get ready schedule. In six weeks from the time the selected commanders and troops were alerted, they were organized into a mechanized force, given intensive training, and moved from their home station, Fort Lewis, Washington. The troops were transported by commercial and military buses from Nellis Air Force Base to the test site, a distance of 100 miles. Trucks, guns, and tanks, as soon as they were unloaded, proceeded to the test site without delay. The task force was comprised of a mechanized rifle company, a mechanized battalion headquarters, a platoon of tanks, a battery of 105 millimeter howitzers, and a headquarters company, which included a battalion mortar and Davy Crockett platoon. Arriving at the AEC test site, the troops were billeted in a trailer camp located approximately 25 miles from the selected exercise area. Here, the various troop units were given further orientation on the nature and scope of this special mission. Complete preparations had been made for their arrival and occupancy of quarters thus obviating the necessity for transporting much impedimenta normally required for a field exercise. Substantial mess halls were provided and fresh cooked food was served upon arrival and at all morning and evening meals. The men lost no time on crating equipment. The headquarters of the exercise director was located in a similar nearby camp. The headquarters consisted of a normal staff augmented to handle the special requirements of this mission. Preparations for the exercise began on schedule. Men and equipment moved out and reconnoitered the terrain over which they would operate. Several dry runs were carried out at critical points to familiarize the men with the time schedule of the overall operation. Preventive maintenance activities were begun immediately to assure the effectiveness of all equipment required for the exercise. Timing and coordinating a field exercise of this type called for exact pre-planning of the functions and movements of each individual unit involved. This field exercise was not a wargaming maneuver, but rather a pre-designed demonstration of the tactical employment of low-yield nuclear weapons in conjunction with conventional weapons. Close support weapons were set up in advance in preparation for registering and firing upon pre-selected target areas in the first phase of the operation. The artillery battery was likewise set up in its supporting position, and registration rounds were fired onto the targets designated in each phase of the overall operation. Each element of the task force was briefed in its particular responsibilities, including the precise safety measures to be taken at each stage of the overall operation.
The objective of this operation is to demonstrate tactically the infantry and armor's current organic low-yield nuclear delivery system, the Davy Crockett. The tactical situation has been pre-designed to illustrate the employment of Davy Crockett in support of an attack. The plan of the exercise calls for the Davy Crockett to be fired in the zone of action of the 1st Mechanized Battalion, 12th Infantry. Our forces are disposed as indicated here. Company A with an attached platoon of tanks. Company B simulated. Company C also simulated is in reserve. Other elements actually participating are the mortars, the recoilless rifles, the light Davy Crockett launcher, maximum range 2,000 meters, the two heavy Davy Crockett launchers, maximum range 4,000 meters, the supporting artillery battery, and the battalion headquarters. The enemy in this sector of the combat zone has been driven back to these positions. He also holds strong reserves here. The battalion has been ordered to secure objectives one and two. Company A will attack to seize objective one. Company B will attack to seize objective two. To assist in breaching the enemy's defenses, one Davy Crockett nuclear round will be detonated here, 26 minutes prior to the attack. The significance of this operation was recognized throughout our military establishment. Key representatives from all the services and other interested agencies were invited to observe this historic event, a critical first for the Army. The president was represented by close personal advisors. Prior to the exercise, the observers were oriented on the salient characteristics of the Davy Crockett system and on the overall scheme of maneuver they would witness. The countdown for the firing of the nuclear round was under control of the Defense Atomic Support Agency. Safety measures for the exercise were supervised by the chief safety officer. At H minus five minutes, all troops were ordered to take cover in previously prepared trenches. At H minus three minutes, all observers put on high density goggles or turned their backs to the direction of the burst to avoid retinal burns. At H minus two minutes, green star clusters were fired as the final warning before the detonation. The round was launched at H minus 17 seconds to accomplish H hour impact on the desired ground zero at a range of 2,852 meters. The round was set for a low height of burst. It detonated perfectly, releasing its lethal radiation. Like any other nuclear weapon, the Davy Crockett gives off three basic effects. Heat, blast, and nuclear radiation. By far the most significant effect is its deadly initial nuclear radiation. The 3,000 rad line, criterion for prompt casualties, extended approximately 200 meters. The 650 rad line, criterion for delayed casualties, extended approximately 350 meters. Troops located approximately 1,600 meters from the detonation were well beyond the minimum safe distance. In comparison, thermal effects to exposed skin would have been insignificant at any of these ranges. Second degree burns would have extended to only a distance of about 100 meters. The crater produced by the blast was militarily insignificant.
moderate damage to tanks from blast extended to about 20 meters. The average winds at the time of the detonation were south-southeast at 25 kilometers per hour. These caused a rather elongated fallout pattern. At one hour after the burst, the one rad per hour contour extended over 1,700 meters downwind. The 10 rad per hour contour extended 700 meters. With a smaller 10 rad per hour contour and closing a hot spot further downwind. An aerial survey of radiological intensities was made shortly after the burst by a monitoring team. The data obtained by this team, combined with ground survey data, established the pattern of radiation intensities in the area of the operation. The battalion commander performed his tactical damage assessment by helicopter. His personal observations combined with the radiological data collected, provided the information necessary to complete his estimate of the situation. In the event radiation intensities had prevented him from following his primary plan, he would have had to implement a contingency plan. His information, however, assured him that his primary plan could be followed. This plan called for two platoons of Company A to attack Objective 1, along this axis, while the 3rd platoon secured the battalion's right flank by seizing the shoulder of the penetration. In his damage assessment flight, the battalion commander had observed a previously unreported enemy force in an assembly area here. He estimated it to be a reinforced mechanized company. This force would menace his right flank during the movement to seize Objective 1. The battalion commander, therefore, decided to engage this target of opportunity with two nuclear rounds as soon as he could displace his Davy Crockett launchers within range of the target. Meanwhile, he would contain this enemy force with artillery and mortar fire. Troops were ordered into their carriers in preparation for the attack as soon as the battalion commander had determined that his primary plan could be implemented. At H plus 26, with the platoon of tanks supporting the effort of Company A, the battalion jumped off. Artillery and mortar fire supported the advance. right platoon of Company A, supported by tanks, seized the right shoulder of the penetration, thereby assuring the remainder of the company free movement toward Objective 1. Artillery and mortar fire on the target of opportunity prevented this enemy element from interfering with the advance to Objective 1. When the right platoon secured the right shoulder, the tanks with this unit were in position to supplement the artillery and mortar fire on the target of opportunity. When the company minus reached its dismount point, all elements of the battalion were able to begin the final phase of the attack. Supporting fires lifted and shifted on call from the company commanders. Tanks moved forward in support of the infantry. By this time, the light Davy Crockett, which had been displacing in the rear of the advance, was in position to begin adjustment of fire on the target of opportunity. 
The heavy system was required to alter its route of displacement because of radiation intensities and was therefore somewhat delayed going into position. Nevertheless, within 11 minutes of the time Objective 1 was taken, the heavy system was in position and firing its final adjusting round. Two simulated nuclear fires were placed on the target of opportunity as planned. With this action, the exercise was considered to be successfully terminated. Immediately following the exercise, the battalion employed standard unit decontamination procedures to ensure that vehicles and men were freed of the main possible source of radiological contamination. Radiac equipment was used to detect contamination exceeding the safety criteria of the exercise. No one needed further decontamination and only two vehicles required a washdown. On this July day, 1962, the Army demonstrated its ability to plan and safely conduct a tactical exercise involving the use of low-yield nuclear weapons. It was further demonstrated that a battalion has the capability to employ the Davy Crockett tactically and that the doctrine for such employment is sound. The Davy Crockett was not designed to win battles by itself. Only when it is integrated with other combat power available to the commander, as was demonstrated today, does this weapon fill the need for which it was designed to give the infantry and armor unit commanders simple yet effectively responsive nuclear firepower. <laughs>